So where were we? Oh yes, sociology. A branch of study adopted by higher academia around the turn of the 20th century, the roots of sociology date back to the early Greek philosophers, whose observations about the people and culture that surrounded them continue to hold water, even to this day. While the groundwork for this social science almost always traces back to psychology, Emile Durkheim, the founder of the first sociology courses taught, professed it as the science of institutions, their genesis, and their function. Why do I bring this up? Because it's interesting. Turn this focus on the structure of many existing institutions, including media, and one can shed new light and understanding on them. Many reviewers, I find, have their best moments when the wit is cast aside and instead a veil is temporarily lifted, revealing the social constructs held high as absolute truth. Now this may just be the young idealist in me reading far too much into entertainment. I can't help but see great opportunities for sociological analysis in many great works, many surrounding one particular character, a personality whose plights and struggles have become a centerpiece of American culture, a sterling example of societal change inspired by one man. Yes, we're talking about the Batman. In almost all incarnations, this beleaguered man who suffered a tragedy early in life exemplifies a strange ideal for outcasts. Bruce Wayne focuses on the criminal mind to such an extent that all he seems to think about is how the villains view the world, in an effort to clearly see their plans and bring them to justice. Yet if we look closely at the character, it's clear his perspective became disjointed long ago for most individual members of the population. However. The point today is not to delve into the fascinating psychological structure of the bat, but instead note the observer it created. He has removed himself from the scene, watching from the shadows, taking notes, interacting only when his own perception of reality deems it necessary. An outsider, even in his publicly known personality, Batman showcases an ideal sociological perspective. So as you can imagine, that leaves a wide variety of Batman to go through before finding the most thorough example of sociology personified. Luckily for me, one such film was released, which shows not only this condition in Batman, but a very verbal counterexample, who dives in with both feet, uncaring, obeying his id, and just screwing with the societal hierarchy to no end. Why so serious? We're talking about the Dark Knight. Christopher Nolan's golden ticket with Hollywood, it broke records with a film that redefined what people have come to expect from comic book movies excellence. Every scene is ripe with subtext. Yes, even this one. Fortunately for me, many of the issues addressed in this film cut right to the heart of sociology, from responsibility of a group towards other groups to understanding why social figureheads exist. Fair warning, I am going to parallel Batman and Joker a ton in this review. Seriously, I've waited. Let's start. The film begins on a shot of the city. I mean, a shot of this building being shot. Wait, why am I doing a scene by scene? It's the Dark Knight. If you haven't seen it, where were you three years ago? Go rent it or something. For the rest of the audience, let's touch on the first surprisingly subtle actions of the Joker. He creates a plan that plays off of the fear of mortality. Every henchman has the word to kill their accomplices when their assigned task is done, implanting the idea that each time one goon murders another, the shares each would walk away with will increase. The Joker plays into the robber's greed to tie up potential loose ends, sure, but I also think he does it to prove a social theory. And then we'll see how loyal a hungry dog really is. Simple, yet eloquent. The Joker doesn't start out as more than a nuisance for either the mob or the city which shows how jaded they are since he did pull off a multi-million dollar heist. No, he has to make his stance at a meeting of the heads of the mob and walk away without losing stride. This will construct him as the major social problem, which will force the mob to either deal with him or appease him. It's the classic social intimidation that has actually changed many societies throughout history. But there's an easier way to explain it. Hey DM, you busy? Really? You're wearing plus five armor, really? Because, uh, I'm looking here, and, uh, yep, sorcerer plus plate equals Y! Oh, hey, you made it! Good, uh, we just got started. Uh, what do you say you're at the tavern getting drunk? Actually, I'm not here to roleplay, just need a minute of your time. Uh, oh, okay. Scenario. Mob bosses are meeting to discuss their group money laundering scheme. Oh, like that scene from The Dark Knight, yeah. Exactly. 
What's the sociological importance of this meeting? Uh, what? Why are they having it and not just sending out a mass communication about it? Oh, well, that's easy. Imagine you're some big self-important mob boss who's being hunted by Batman. Now that you're done patting yourself on the back on how important you are, realize that he's the goddamn Batman. Sucks for you, right? That it would. Batman also seems to be in cahoots with the cops, who are notorious for tapping anything with wires. Make a phone call or send a text message, you might as well just forward it to the Batputer right now. Ah, so while archaic, the physical meeting in a restaurant's kitchen eliminates the possibility of exposure. Exactly, exactly. Plus a daytime meeting also cuts down on the likelihood of a bat problem, if you know what I mean. Now, let's say this scene happens in a role play, and a player character walks into that scene. Oh, really? Which, which character are we talking about? The Joker. No. But... I would sooner let someone play Batman than have any version of the Joker in any of my parties. You... you'd really allow Batman? Yeah, yeah. Got the rules right here out somewhere. Uh, hold on. Okay, wait on the reference for a bit. My point is, what does the Joker do right in this scene? Oh, easy. He's owning it. He walks in, creepy, yet confident, makes a statement with a smile and a pencil. Ta -da! This forces them to pay attention, because they're all intimidated as hell. He demands half their money, and shows that he's not some two-bit criminal, but a partner who's getting in on this deal, whether they like it or not. And finally, when someone doesn't like it, that's when he pulls the dead man switch. You think you could steal from us and just walk away? Yeah. He's matter-of-fact because he already won. He walks in, kicks the mob in the junk, demands half, and walks out without incident. He won hard. Playing intimidation games to invoke social change is a classic move, and the Joker illustrates why. Thanks, DM. No problem. I'll get back to you on that Batman thing soon. Now, where was I? Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure you can wear a plate. If you hate spellcasting.